studies. A specialist in 19th century European art, she published several books in the field, including a college textbook. Petra is also the founding co-editor of the open access journal, 19th Century Art Worldwide, which is currently in its 20th year. And it's a journal that I can safely say is near and dear to the hearts of probably most of us here this evening. Together with Max Donnelly in the UK, Andrew Montana in Australia, and Suzanne Veldink in the Netherlands, Petra recently completed a book on Daniel Cotier, which will be co-published by the Paul Mellon Center um, for British Art and Yale University this spring. This is a book that many of us have been eagerly, eagerly awaiting. And her talk tonight will focus on Cotier's activities in New York City for all lovers of the aesthetic movement, not to mention, of course, stained glass and the decorated interior. We are in for a treat as Petra presents Cotier & Co. on Fifth Avenue, New York, a one-stop shop for the house beautiful. As with previous lectures, please do put your questions in the chat as they come up and we'll save some time for questions and answers uh, following the talk. Petra, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for this very nice introduction. Are you seeing the full screen or not? Or, or do you see the little slides on the side? We see the slides on the side. Try hitting the um, the button up on the top, just under where it says draw, where it looks like, yes, that. Yeah, try that. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's better, right? So now I'm one slide too far. Perfect. Okay, again, thank you very much for uh, this very nice introduction. And thanks to the board of the New York uh, chapter of the Victorian Society for inviting me to speak here tonight and for all your help in, uh, in uh, kind of preparing this lecture. Uh, I wanna do something that I normally don't do. Um, I wanna kind of welcome a few people that are have zoomed into this lecture. Um, because uh, there are a number that have a very special connection either with Cartier or with the, um, the book project that we have been engaged in. And the first I want to welcome is Max Donnelly, my co-author, uh, who is in the UK, so it's 11 o'clock at night for him, <laughs> but he's still awake. He happens to be on the screen so I can see him. Uh, and I'm very happy that he's here because he can help me field some really pesky questions that uh, you may want to ask me and to which I may not know an answer, and I'm sure he will. Um, I also want to welcome somebody I don't really know, but uh, whom I have been corresponding with, and that is Nordy Hobler. And Nordy has many, uh, you know, outstanding uh, accomplishments of her own, but I'm especially happy that she's here because her mother, Margaret Hobler, uh, really is the person who put Cartier on the map. Um, after he had been really uh, largely forgotten in the, uh, in the 20th century. And she wrote one of the greatest MA theses that I've ever read, uh, which uh, she completed at Hunter in 1987. Uh, she unfortunately passed away, but it's very nice to have her daughter here. She told me she still has all the notes of her mother, uh, which we should have known, <laughs> that would have been great, uh, about the project. And uh, Margaret Hobler is really a, a, a key person in, in cardio research. Uh, another person uh, who uh, I hope is here, she's signed up for the lecture, is Alice Freelinghuisen. And of course, she is also, together with Margaret, uh, one of the people who who started to look at cardio in a very serious way, uh, particularly in the, <clears throat> the um, exhibition catalog uh, that she co-produced, uh, the very important exhibition of 1987, In Pursuit of Beauty, Americans and the Aesthetic Movement. <clears throat> uh, two other persons I would like to welcome because they have been very helpful to us when we were doing our book is Dawn Breen, uh, Associate Curator of Decorative Arts at the Frick Pittsburgh, and Barbara Vies at the uh, uh, Curator of Decorative Arts at the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, both of them have been very helpful to us in 
um, getting our images, which was not so easy uh, to get the images for the book in, in COVID times. So we, we've had a lot of help from them and of course also from many other people. And the last person I want to welcome is my granddaughter, Anya Chu, uh, because she walked with me all over Brooklyn Heights to find two churches with cardio windows, uh, which we did find, uh, and which I'm actually not going to show because uh, we don't really have very good pictures of them. But uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, it, it, it was a, a great way to kind of get acquainted with some of the works of Cardio uh, in New York. Um, I want to just say uh, very briefly uh, something about the name Cartier. Um, he, his name is often pronounced Cartier, which is the kind of French way, of course, of saying Cartier. And uh, we know we found actually a reference in a 19th century um, contemporary source that told us that he really liked to be called Cartier. And Cartier, of course, is a British word, it's also a French word. Uh, but uh, he definitely preferred the, the, the pronunciation Collier. So that's you know, what you know, Max and I and all the authors of the book have generally uh, used. Uh, I want to start with this not so particularly attractive slide of uh, a building on Fifth Avenue, 144 Fifth Avenue between 19th and 20th Street, which was the home of Cardio & Co between 1873 and 1895. Uh, the building doesn't look more attractive, of course, by the scaffolding. Uh, I have some other pictures, but it seems that there is always some construction going on um, uh, on this building. It must have looked a great deal more attractive uh, in the 1870s after Cartier had taken possession of it. Uh, when Max and I looked at it a couple of years ago, when it was also under construction, we actually noticed that on the two pilasters on either side, uh, there was some white and some gold paint. So we have to assume, we have to think of this building without the uh, fire escape, uh, uh, without, of course, the scaffolding, without the ugly buildings on either side. And finally, also, we have to think of it in terms of color, uh, color on the important architectural details. And that also includes these two very beautiful um, a cast iron reliefs on either side uh, of the central window of the third floor. Uh, where the, the, the relief on the left says um, um, uh, 144 and then on the right, Fifth Avenue, New York. Uh, we don't really know who designed them, but it does seem to be really of Cartier's time. That kind of very playful uh, design really seems to be of that period. And it may have been Cartier, or maybe even have been Ingalls, who was Cartier's um, uh, representative and later his partner. Uh, in New York. So Collier & Co. Um, in New York uh, was founded by um, Collier together with his friend uh, James Ingalls. Uh, and you see there are two busts here, both made by the American sculptor Olin Levi Warner, uh, who was a, a friend of both men. Um, Collier and Ingalls uh, traveled to New York on the SS Baltic in 1873, uh, arrived in September, and probably immediately started to look for a building in which they could establish a, um, a, a store, a business, where they planned to sell everything for the home, from furniture to rugs to um, upholstery to um, to knickknacks um, uh, etc uh, the home they found was actually a townhouse on fifth avenue something like the townhouses in brooklyn that you see on the right of this slide and either cardio and co or perhaps an earlier uh, occupant uh, had rebuilt the townhouse by taking down the stoop uh, or, the, or the stairs, and uh, they created a, a shop in the first floor, which is 
you know, what in America is often called an English basement. It's kind of slightly underground. Uh, and then later on, they would also create a gallery on the second floor and the rest of the building was probably uh, uh, rented. Uh, we do not know whether they owned the building, whether they rented the building, whether they rented only the two floors of the building. Uh, we only know that they were here for uh, you know, a very extended uh, period of time. Now, Carter and Co. as this, as a uh, store for um, interior decoration uh, wasn't, of course, bringing something new. I mean, there were other uh, business like it uh, in New York already, mostly in that same area in the Flatiron District. Uh, there were Herter Brothers, Kimball and Cabus, uh, uh, Pottier and Stimus, Leon Marcotte. Uh, this, this was a kind of business that was, um, you know, that, that was in vogue uh, at that time. However, Cardio and Ingalls uh, were trying to bring something new, or at least they were advertising themselves as bringing something new. And that is that what they were bringing was not um, uh, interior decoration for the super rich, the Vanderbilts and, and, and so on, uh, but they were um, uh, uh, bringing interiors for people with taste. So the emphasis was really on this idea of taste rather than money. And you see some of this in an article that was published in 1874, one year after uh, Carter and Co. opened in Scribner's Monthly Magazine. It's an anonymous article. We don't really know for sure who wrote it. And uh, it says here, well, I can't really read it. It's a little behind my text here. Uh, there can hardly be a more uh, fantastic treat. I can't read that. For the lover of rich color and beautiful form than to pass directly from the dull uniformity and architectural ugliness of the Fifth Avenue into the showroom of Cotter and Co. This room seems as strange in New York as a rose bed with nightingales and a fountain would be come upon in the backyard of a First Avenue tenement house. I mean, really a kind of very interesting description in many ways. And then the writer goes on and says, looking at the best of our rich men's houses where individual taste has but little play, and where the whim of fashion and the hour is fed not by men working in the domain of art, but by shopkeepers whose business is only to exchange their tawdry for the rich man's money, the effect of this apartment, that is to say the interior of Cartier's shop, so splendid and yet so quiet, exhilarating and yet soothing, the sense teaches a good solid lesson that money can do nothing by itself, it must be content to take its place as a servant. And it's only when used by a taste that enjoys what it produces that anything artistic or decorative worth having is produced. So you really see this emphasis on taste um, as opposed to um, money. In the same year that Cartier and Engels uh, established a shop in New York, uh, another friend of Cartier by the name of John Lamb Lyon uh, traveled uh, by boat to Australia and established a, a shop in Sydney. Uh, now, uh, unlike Ingalls, who was really the manager of Cartier in New York, uh, Lyon was a partner. And so he called his shop Lyon, Cartier and Co to kind of you know, indicate that idea of partnership. And what you see here is an advertisement uh, uh, for Lion Collier & Co. of 1879. And what you notice is that really uh, he advertises Collier & Co. as a kind of a global um, interior decorating empire. So in the center above that oval area, you see 8 Pall Mall London. That was, of course, the original shop in London uh, uh, established by Cardio. We'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, and then around that, you have the three addresses, Pall Mall, Fifth Avenue, New York, and Liverpool Street in Sydney. 
And you also get a little bit idea of all the stuff that they do, artistic interior decorations, stained glass, fresco painting, art furniture, um, um, uh, staircase windows, et cetera, et cetera. And also some of the prizes that they have uh, received already at the uh, international exhibitions in Paris as well as um, London. So this is kind of this uh, important, this idea that Claudia really wanted to create this kind of global empire uh, to, uh, you know, for the beautiful home. Now, who was Daniel Cotier? I just want to give you a, a, a brief biography. Uh, you see here his photograph. Um, um, as you see, quite a, quite a handsome uh, person. Uh, he was born in 1838 uh, in Glasgow. Uh, his uh, father was a seaman and was quite old when Cotier was born. He was already in his 70s and he died uh, when he was uh, when he was a little boy. Uh, so uh, already as a young man, probably in the early 50s, he was apprenticed to a glass painter in uh, Glasgow. Uh, and he stayed there for a number of years uh, until uh, he more or less had learned whatever he could learn. And then he uh, went on what the Germans would call some Wanderjahre. So he, he kind of traveled around a bit to look around. He stayed for a while in Edinburgh and then he went to London and in London he took classes at the famous Working Man College which was as you know founded by uh, Maurice and a, and a group of Christian socialist friends to kind of educate young, um, uh, young apprentices and, and, and young workmen. And uh, at this college, uh, he may have taken classes with no less than Ruskin and Fort Maddox Brown, because one of the prides of the college was that they had really outstanding uh, teachers. Now, after these uh, this, this kind of years of, of traveling around and, and, and learning, uh, he went back to Scotland and he became uh, a manager at the stained glass works of Field and Allen in Edinburgh. Actually, they had two, uh, they had two places, two works, one in Edinburgh and one in Leeds. Uh, four years later, uh, he married the boss's daughter, uh, Marion Field. And uh, he felt that that was kind of a good time to set up his own shop, uh, also in Edinburgh. And uh, that, uh, in the beginning, was a very successful um, uh, move. So um, he lived in Edinburgh, but he did a lot of work in Glasgow. There was a great deal of church building going on in Glasgow. And um, uh, Cardio got very much involved in this. Uh, he painted the interior of these churches. He also um, made stained glass windows. And I just want to show you one example. Uh, these are two beautiful windows that he made for Dowen Hill Church in Glasgow, uh, which is no longer a church today, but it's a theater and, and, and restaurant. And here you see these very monumental figures of David and Miriam. Uh, and you see here already some of the aspects of Cotier's style. Uh, he liked monumental figures, very rich colors. And generally his work is not Gothic as so many stained glass windows in the 19th century were, but he's influenced by classical sources. In this particular case, of course, it's very clearly Assyrian or Egyptian, mostly, mostly Assyrian, which was a style that was kind of advocated at that time for Old Testamental subjects. Uh, but later on, he's also influenced by um, by Greek and Roman, uh, Roman art. But this kind of monumental uh, large figures is, is something very characteristic of, of Cartier's work. Um, now, um, at the same time that he uh, was kind of making a reputation for himself in Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, he also uh, started a family. And Marion and uh, he, uh, uh, in in rather quick succession, had three children. One of uh, one of them unfortunately passed away. Uh, 
uh, and eventually they would have another child. Uh, but despite the success, uh, three years after he had established his own shop in Edinburgh, he decided to move to London. And this was not because uh, the business was not good. I think it was because he realized that perhaps uh, stained glass was ultimately limited. And he wanted to, uh, to do more, he wanted to have a bigger business. Uh, he saw an opportunity in domestic decoration. I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and so he moved to London and he started a business called Cotier and Co. Uh, and originally he called it Art Furniture and Tile Painters. So that was his initial purview. And then later uh, it, it expands from furniture to uh, tiles to uh, you know, everything else uh, for the home. Uh, the business was successful. Uh, he eventually moved to Pall Mall. And then, uh, as we have already seen, decided to branch out and set up shop in New York with Ingalls and with uh, a lion in, um, uh, in Sydney. Um, the business was very successful. Um, and I think a lot of this had to do with Cartier's talent for picking his people. He, ha he had a great uh, gift to find the right people for the right job. And so uh, all of the three branches of his business did, did quite well. And Cartier's role was really as a con of an impresario, uh, consultant, supervisor. He would travel uh, regularly, well, not so regularly to Australia, but very regularly to New York. Uh, he also was a buyer. Uh, and so he kind of gave a general, he kind of kept the whole thing uh, going in, in, a, in a very general way. Um, I have the feeling that New York, the shop in New York was uh, very dear to him. He traveled to New York many of his, many times, often with his family. And in fact, two of his, of his three children married Americans and many Cartier descendants still live in the United States today. Now, despite the fact that Cartier was traveling all the time and, and you know, which must be really extremely fatiguing, um, uh, he actually was in ill health most of his life. As a young man, he had rheumatic fever and later this caused, uh, as it often does, um, uh, heart problems. And uh, he, uh, he died early uh, in his 50s. Uh, and was actually, he died actually in America, not in New York, but in Jacksonville, Florida. But he is buried in New York in uh, the Woodlawn Cemetery uh, in the Bronx. Uh, and later his wife's ashes were brought over uh, uh, there as well. And so you see here their, um, you know, their, uh, their gravestone uh, in that cemetery. Um, I want to say a little bit about what I think, or what actually Max and I, we should really kind of say this together because we've talked so much about Cartier. What we really think is the, um, uh, is the secret of Cartier's success. First of all, of course, he was a talented designer. And also, as I already mentioned, he knew how to pick his people, his his managers and also the artists that he and designers that he used in his his various shops also i think important is that he had a great personality and you see some of that in the portraits uh, you know you see a kind of a sturdy man you have the feeling that it, that he had a, must have a booming voice that at any time he could start laughing you would like to have a beer with him in the pub uh so he's, he was very gregarious outgoing um uh kind of person uh, he had a great gift for public relations and already knew uh, the importance of what we today would call influencers. And wherever he went, whether it was in London or it was in New York, he immediately found somebody who could serve that role and then befriended that person 
and um, and um, uh, let that person do the work that he wanted them to do. Uh, he also had uh, great ideas about marketing and very cleverly uh, used in all three locations um, the, um, the context with what I call the Scottish diaspora. So if you look at the people who were his main clients, very many of them were from, uh, from Scottish descent. And finally, uh, I think a secret of his success was that he was very uh, in tune with the trends of his time. And one of these trends, and this is, I think, really why he started this business, was what Walter Benjamin uh, once called the addiction to dwellings of the last quarter of the 19th century. So this idea that people were in love with their home and wanted to, admit, to make it beautiful and the home is my castle, that kind of idea uh, that was very, uh, very common in, in the Gilded Age in America, but of course also in Europe and England and also in France. Walter Benjamin, of course, was primarily writing about France. And this addiction to dwellings was coupled with um, uh, what the curators of the Metropolitan Museum called the pursuit of beauty, uh, which of course we, uh, what we call aestheticism. And, and, and Collier totally kind of bought in and, and took advantage, you might say, of, of this trend. Um, as I mentioned, um, Collier and Co in New York sold everything for the home. And what does that mean? I show you here a room in a house that no longer exists, a J.C. Phillips house in Boston. Uh, but uh, that was reproduced in the famous uh, book by George William Sheldon, Artistic Houses. And uh, almost everything that you find in this room was something you could have found in Cartier's shop. And in fact, I think that much of it came from that shop. So the rug, uh, the uh, upholstered furniture and the non-upholstered furniture, uh, the tiles in the fireplace, uh, the paintings on the wall, the fabrics, you see perhaps these beautiful portières on either side of the opening to the next room. All of this was for sale at Cardiers. Even the China, Ch Chinese porcelain, uh, European, Meissen porcelain, little knickknacks um, uh, that uh, you see also all over this house, <coughs> this room. Um, you could buy all of them um, in, in Cartier's store. Now, um, some of these Cartier bought, you know, of course the Chinese porcelains um, he acquired, uh, you know, in, in antique shops, uh, the paintings he bought from artists, um, uh, the fabrics he bought and so on and so forth. But some of it he also made and um, fabricated. And we know that Cartier from the very beginning had a workshop in New York as he had workshops in London and, and Sydney. And uh, by the 1880s, the time of his greatest success, this workshop was located on 223 West 28th Street. It's, at the moment, it's an open um, spot. I mean, they're, they're planning to build something there. Uh, according to a contemporary newspaper, he employed 100 people in this workshop, which seems like a lot today, but for example, Herter uh, Brothers employed 700 people. So it was, it was you know, kind of a mid-sized shop. And uh, in the shop, he primarily made furniture and also uh, some, um, there was also a textile shop. So he, of course he did upholstery and also making portieres and other kind of uh, embroidered fabrics um, and so on. Not everything was made in the New York shop. And uh, we think that the stained glass windows um, were probably all imported from London. Even you know, all the stained glass windows that you see in New York churches and, and, and that were in, in, in private homes. Uh, um, were probably shipped from London to New York. We can't be sure, 
but there is very little indication that the shop in New York uh, uh, produced stained glass windows. And we have a little report of this shop uh, because in 1886, John Lamb Lyon, uh, who, as you know, was who, as you remember, was in the shop in Sydney, he traveled to um, uh, New York and he visited the shop and in his diary, which the diary is a little bit um, abbreviated, but you still get an idea. He writes, the shop is very spacious, room to do a lot of work, very fine machinery. The power is got from an engine in an adjoining building. Mr. Holland is the artist and seems to be good at flowers on, on furniture. Saw a grand piano, goldy looking satin wood, ornament with cupids, roses and ribbons look very rich for us. Rich for a small log, they paid 500 pounds. It's cut up into veneers, a bed of the same wood, coverlet, yellow satin. They make hangings on the mosaic system, etc. etc. So, uh, you see that it's fabrics, it's furniture, but we don't really see any reference to um, uh, to windows. Um, even with the research that we have done, it has been very difficult to find pieces um, made by Collier and Co. in New York. I mean, we have found some, uh, but not really that many. And particularly for the early period for the um, 1870s, uh, uh, we have found nothing, but we do know a little bit about what she did do because several of Cartier's furniture pieces of the 70s are reproduced in a book by Clarence Cook, The House Beautiful, a book that was based on a series of articles that he had published in Scribner's Magazine a year earlier. Uh, and the book itself was published in 1878 with a cover design by Cartier. So I, I mentioned earlier that Cartier, you know, tried to find influencers in every place where he went and Cook served that role um, in New York. And uh, throughout the book, if you read The House Beautiful carefully, you see numerous references to Cartier and uh, also a number of reproductions of Cartier's furniture. For example, here, a chair and table from Cartier's. Um, um, uh, and you notice that uh, the table is still in it was kind of in a kind of an Anglo-Japanese style, a little kind of Godwin uh, inspired, uh, which is seems to be typical of the early uh, furniture by Cartier. And then you see this kind of relatively low upholstered chair. And uh, actually Cook write, writes in a very complimentary way about this chair. He says, it's it looks small, but it is very comfortable. And it fits well in a small New York apartment. And Cook liked kind of a little space, a little space in apartments. He didn't like the, the overstuffed Victorian furniture uh, completely filling up the room. Now, one of the earliest real pieces by Cartier, definitely made in New York, that we um, uh, that we know is a clock that is today in the Brooklyn Museum. Actually, two of these clocks, there's a slightly earlier one in a private collection, but I'm showing you here the one in the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, it, we know that it was made, uh, definitely made in New York because it was actually a joint venture of Cartier and Co and Tiffany and Co. Cartier made the wooden case and Tiffany made the, um, uh, the, uh, the dial and, and, and the clockwork. Uh, it's a table clock, so it's not, not very big. And as you can see, uh, the emphasis really is here on, on craftsmanship um, uh, and materials. Uh, this clock is, um, uh, is made of mahogany, and this may very well be uh, a very special kind of mahogany, Comino mahogany that Cartier, Cartier used in many of his uh, pieces. It's no longer available today. All the Comino trees from Colombia have been have died out, uh, but in Cartier's time, uh, it was still there. Now, when you open the clock, you know to to wind it up, 
you see here this beautiful di dial, the uh, uh, Tiffany dial. Uh, but uh, what is interesting that is that it gives you a lot of information about the clock because it said, I.T. Williams had me made in 1883, Cotier and Tiffany made me. So we not only know the, the two craftsmen who made it, but we also know the person who commissioned it. And um, Ichabod Williams uh, was one of um, uh, Cotier's major clients. Um, he um, lived on 18 West 36th Street, uh, where he had a, a, a spacious house. Uh, he had his headquarters on 220 11th Avenue, which was actually quite close to Cotier's workshop. And he had a big sawmill in Carteret, New Jersey. He was wealthy, uh, but not uh, Vanderbilt wealthy. You know, he, he was kind of very well to do. Uh, and this was, I think, the kind of client that, uh, that, that Cotier sought. Um, uh, Williams and Cotier and Ingalls became very, very close friends. In fact, uh, Cotier's daughter, Margaret, married William's son, Lloyd. So this kind of gives you an idea how closely the families were connected. And William's entire house was decorated by Cotier. Unfortunately, uh, this clock is the only piece that we know of uh, to have been preserved. Uh, and Williams also had bought from Cotier his entire art collection, because as we will see a little bit later, one of the ways in which Cotier differed from most of the other uh, interior decorating shops is that he had a, an art gallery. Uh, uh, attached to his shop. So we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. But in any case, uh, Williams um, is very important for Cotier. Uh, he is also the one who imported the Comino wood that Cotier used in, in his finest pieces. Uh, moving on uh, to the um, uh, 1890s, um, we see that Cotier's work becomes increasingly sumptuous, heavy, and rich. Um, and this is particularly true for uh, the, the time actually after his death, Cotier dies in 1891, but the firm Cotier and Co. goes on under the supervision of Ingalls, who had become a partner and who eventually becomes the owner. And by the very end of the 19 and the beginning of the 20th century, one of Cotier and Co's major client is Henry Clay Frick. And Cotier does a lot of work for Frick. And among the pieces that are delivered to Frick are a number of Roman and Greek chairs. I'll show you here uh, a Roman chair. And you see a very solid, very heavy kind of piece of furniture. Uh, traditional in this kind of Roman style with this, you know, also this kind of uh, carved decoration on the side. Uh, uh, we now really get into the type of furniture that moves a little bit away, perhaps from the idea of taste and a little bit more in the direction of money. Um, and that is even more true. When we look at this piece, <coughs> Uh, commissioned by Anna Riddle Scott, who was the widow of Thomas Alexander Scott, a uh, very rich person, former president of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. Uh, and this is a, um, uh, uh, the case for a Steinway piano. Cotier uh, actually did, Cotier and Co. in New York did a lot of uh, grand pianos, also upright pianos, whereby the, the works of the piano were delivered to their workshop by Steinway and then they decorated it. And you see that this, that this grand piano is extremely uh, over the top uh, with inlay, with painting, with different kind of woods. Uh, you see that the, ho that the whole, the whole body of the piano is set on these little colonnettes with gilded capitals. Uh, I mean, you, you, everywhere you look, there is carving, inlay, painting. Uh, this, this is a real fantastic 
um, uh, uh, over the top kind of piece. Um, now, uh, the piano shows you uh, one aspect uh, that is rather characteristic of Cartier furniture, and that is painted furniture. Uh, Cartier liked uh, furniture that was painted, and particularly furniture that was painted with uh, sophisticated figure paintings. So here's an early example, again, uh, an, in an illustration from the House Beautiful. Uh, where we see a corner cupboard with these two allegorical figures uh, painted on the uh, on the doors. Now, uh, to do this this kind of painted furniture, Cartier did not just use decorative painters because they really were not probably um, um, skilled enough to do it. He liked to use trained, uh, you know, artists who had really trained in an in, in, in a kind of a more academic um, uh, uh, setting. I mean, who, who had really kind of learned how to paint. And when he came to New York, he tried to befriend several young artists who he thought could do the job for him. And one of these was, was the American artist, Albert Pinkham Ryder. Uh, Cartier was befriended with Ryder and early in his career convinced him to paint furniture for him. Now, unfortunately, none of the furniture pieces have been preserved intact, but we do have some of the paintings that Ryder made for Cartier furniture. And the most important one and the largest one is what you see here. There are three uh, paintings uh, painted on leather, uh, which originally were mounted on a folding screen, like a, like a, like a house, uh, a room screen. And uh, they uh, probably represent uh, the story of uh, Genevieve of Brabant. I mean, it's a medieval story, it's not really important, but you see in the middle, this kind of uh, nude, uh, half nude figure arising from uh, this kind of cloud-like shape. And on either side, you see little, uh, little putty. Uh, the combination of black and gold gives you a little sense of a kind of a Japanese uh, Far Eastern sc lacquer screen, uh, also kind of or oriental looking, <coughs> sorry, other rocks, this kind of diagonal lines by formed by the, um, by the trees. Uh, and you see that again, this is 1876, it's relatively early. And the 70s, of course, is really the, the, the period of this kind of Anglo-Japanese, um, this Japanese influence in, in English art. Um, painted furniture remains a big thing for Cartier and Co. And I show you here a very late example. Uh, this is again in, uh, was made for Frick, it was originally in the Frick Mansion on Fifth Avenue. It's now in the Frick Pittsburgh. And it is a music cabinet. You see the open cabinet on the right where you have the little trays for the sheet music and the closed cabinet on the left. Uh, and it represents very appropriately Orpheus uh, playing on his lyre, of course, to, you know, to in the hope of getting back Eurydice from the underworld. And on the right, we see uh, the king of the underworld, the god of the underworld, Hades and his wife, uh, Persephone. Um, so this, this remains a, a, a very important kind of aspect of, of Cartier furniture. Um, tiles were an important aspect of um, the kind of thing that Cartier did in interiors. And I'll show you here one example. This is a tiled fireplace in Glenview. As you know, it's a, it's a, it's a mansion in Yonkers uh, that is now part of the Hudson River, uh, part of the Hudson River Museum. Uh, the house was not designed by Cartier. It was, uh, you know, it was designed by somebody else. Uh, but um, uh, the fireplace was commissioned from him. And interestingly, as you can see, it's combined at the top with tiles from John Moore Smith. So many of these interiors, of course, show the works of many different shops and many different artists. 
Uh, windows remained a very important part of, um, of Cartier's business. And a lot of these were domestic windows. We no longer really think of stained glass windows as something that you have in your home. But in the Gilded Age, of course, stained glass windows were everywhere. Many people preferred stained glass windows over paintings. And Cartier sold lots of domestic stained glass windows. Um, often very decorative. So on the left, you, actually both of these are examples in the Metropolitan Museum. On the left, a figure of spring, probably part, part of four windows on, on, in four walls of a room uh, representing the four seasons. And on the right, uh, a, a panel very recently acquired by the Met with uh, flowers on a trellis. Again, may have been part of a, of an, of, of a larger group of windows, uh, uh, we don't know. Uh, the designers of these windows um, are not known. Um, Collier, um, in, in, in the later part of his career, uh, no longer really designed things himself, but he was in a sense a kind of a conceptual designer. So he would perhaps sketch a concept and then he would have workmen who would make a finished design, and then, of course, the glassmakers would, uh, you know, make the make the, the window on the basis of that design. In some cases, we do know who designed the windows, and I show you yet one other um, um, window in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, um, Alice Frelinghuysen has been very good <laughs> at, at buying windows for the museum. But then, of course, they're, they're very, very beautiful and, and also relatively rare. Uh, so here uh, we have a window that was designed by a Dutch artist by the name of Matthijs Maris, uh, who lived in London for uh, a number of years. Uh, in fact, he lived uh, in, in Cartier's house. Uh, and that in the beginning, that was a very good relationship. Later, they, they had a fallout. But um, uh, Cartier tried to get Maris to design stained glass windows. And here you see um, one example of this, two scenes from a Tennyson's Lady of Shalott. And this is the kind of window that, uh, you know, Cartier, I think, was really interested in uh, with, with a kind of a narrative scene, uh, again, you know, figurative as opposed to, you know, decorative and, and even, you know, carrying certain kind of meaning, certain kind of significance. Um, in addition to, am I going over my time or can, do, can I have a little bit more time? Of course, please. Okay, all right. It's in fabulous, keep going. <laughs> in addition to um, domestic windows, um, Cartier also made windows for public buildings, uh, clubs, libraries, uh, etc. Uh, most of these have not been preserved, but I do want to show you a design for one window, which actually is, is in a way very important for New York and particularly for Columbia University uh, in New York. This was a design for a window in memory of the architect Henry Ogden Avery, uh, who was the son of the art dealer Samuel Putnam Avery. And Samuel Putnam Avery was a, had, his, had, had his gallery not far from Cartier, and they were very close friends. And when uh, Avery's son died at, at a very young age, um, uh, Avery, uh, the father, Samuel Putnam Avery, decided to donate his, his books, his architectural books, to Columbia University. And as you know, uh, those of you who do research in New York, the Avery Library, I mean, it's, it's very important art and particularly architectural library. And uh, Collier, as, as, a, as a friendly gesture, uh, donated a window for that library. Now the window, as far as we know, has not been preserved. As you know, uh, Columbia College at that time was in Midtown near Rockefeller Center, it only later moved to um, uh, Morningside Heights. So it may have been destroyed. Uh, but in this design, you see that in the center, it showed the allegorical figure of architecture. She's holding a little building in her hand. 
and then uh, on the left and right, the dates and the name of um, of Henry Ogden um, Avery. Finally, uh, Collier did a number of church windows in New York. Uh, I won't show you uh, pictures of them because we never had them professionally photographed. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult to photograph them yourself, especially on your cell phone. Uh, but there are two, uh, two windows in two churches in um, uh, Brooklyn Heights. Uh, there's another window in the, um, uh, um, the Calvary Episcopal Church in, in Gramercy Park. I just want to show you one detail. Uh, this is of, a, of the so-called children's window in the Presbyterian Church in, in Brooklyn Heights. And this is a church that was dedicated to the uh, children of the congregation that had died in infancy. It's actually a very beautiful window and particularly beautiful for the representation of flowers. So this is kind of the detail I want to show you here. Uh, the only other window, church window that I want to show you is the one in the Church of the Incarnation. Uh, which is on Madison Avenue. Um, uh, it's practically next to the Morgan Library. And maybe you, many of you have gone there because it's a beautiful interior and it has the work by almost every great Gilded Age American artist uh, inside it. And uh, it has windows by, um, by Morris, by uh, holiday, you know, by uh, by uh, Tiffany. I mean, there's very great windows, and one window by Collier. You see uh, my rather poor photograph of the whole window on the left, and then the two uh, details on the right. It's a window that uh, is on the theme of the Eucharist of the of the of the of the bread. So uh, you have the Old Testamental scene of the uh, of the uh, eating of the manna, and you have the New Testamental scene of Christ feeding the multitudes. Now, another five minutes on the one aspect of Cartier that I really, uh, that, that kind of led to my interest in Cartier. You know, many of you, all of you perhaps know that I'm not at all a decorative uh, arts specialist, although I have become really interested in it through this project. But my interest is really uh, has been for s some years in the art market. And uh, Cartier, of course, uh, as I mentioned already earlier, also um, uh, was an art dealer, not from the beginning. I mean, he did not right away start with an art gallery. He started at a couple of years after uh, they opened a shop on the second floor of the building on, um, uh, on Fifth Avenue. And as an art dealer, Cartier was really a pioneer. Um, he, um, he specialized in um, Barbizon School Art, which was not so pioneering. I mean, other dealers like Nodlers and Schaus uh, and others uh, also sold uh, Barbizon art. Um, Kuro was really his favorite, and uh, the painting that you see here, uh, Orpheus Greeting the Dawn, was a painting that, um, that Cartier loved and, and in fact, um, uh, never sold. But what was his real innovation in New York was that he launched the paintings of the so-called Hague School, which was a school of Dutch artists who worked in, the, around, in and around the city of The Hague in the 18 you know, the last quarter of the 19th century. Now today, the painters of Hague School have fallen very much out of fashion, uh, but Cartier made them so famous in New York uh, that the name of the artist whose work you see here, Anton Mauve, uh, was as common in the 1890s as the name of Van Gogh would be in the 1990s. Everybody knew Mauve's work and all the great collectors bought it. And you see that this particular painting by Mauve was actually bought by Benjamin Altman. So major collector, of course, of the, um, uh, uh, of the period. And everybody agreed that uh, it was Cartier who had introduced 
uh, America to the um, Hague School, and then all the other dealers eventually, five, 10 years later, uh, also uh, got on the, on the Hague School bandwagon. Cardiolite paintings that were tonal, that means they were not very colorful, but they were in tones of beige and brown and gray and, and stuff like that. And the reason of that is clear, I think when you look at this interior, this is the same Phillips house that we saw earlier, but this is the drawing room. And you see that these houses were so busy between the wallpaper and, and everything else, that to have a, a large colorful painting in a large gilded frame would, would really kind of disturb uh, the effect. So he liked, uh, you know, subdued paintings, uh, generally in simple frames. You see that the painting on the wall here on the left wall is set in a very simple frame. So they wouldn't really clash, uh, you might say, with the surroundings. Now, a final remark about Cardio's art dealership that is interesting, although not at all unusual. Cardio only dealt in European art. Uh, so he did not at all uh, sell the works of contemporary American artists, even though he knew them. We saw already that he went to Ryder and asked him to paint furniture, but he would not have his art in his shop. And that is typical of the period, Nodler, Schaus, other dealers also uh, were hesitant uh, uh, to deal in American art. Now in Collier's case, it was even more interesting and, 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 and strange in a way, uh, because we know that he was very close friends with many artists. Um, and many of the artists that he was friends with lived in uh, the so-called Benedict Building, which is a building on Washington Square that was originally built as bachelor flats. And uh, today uh, on, the, on the picture of the right, you see uh, the building today, it's actually owned by, by NYU. But in this building lived a lot of artists uh, and many of them, Cartier knew very well, or was close friends with. William Getney Bunch, John LaForge, Albert Pingham Ryder, Augustus St. Gardens, uh, Alden Levi Warner, the sculptor, J. Alden Weir, Stanford White. Uh, he knew all of them and was particularly befriended with Albert Pinkham Ryder and J. Alden Weir. I have the suspicion that, um, but I can't prove it, that Cartier uh, also rented an apartment in the Benedict whenever he was in New York, uh, because we don't ever see that he rented a place in the building, uh, you know, that uh, that he owned. Um, what he, we also know for, that for the, some of these artists, like <coughs> Warner, made portrait bust of Cartier, we already saw, and also of his children, and Alden Weir. But J. Alden Weir also made portraits of the entire Cartier family. So they, so, so they had a very close connection. And Cartier did help these friends to sell their works. He just didn't want to show them in his gallery. And I want to, this is my last slide, I promise. Um, uh, I want to show you one example. This is Albert Pinkham Ryder's famous Toilers of the Sea, uh, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was actually in the possession of Eichabod Williams, who had bought it on Cartier's advice. And uh, so that it very often happened that Cartier told all of his patrons and people that bought for me, oh, buy something of this young American artist. Uh, you know, he, he does really great work. So I thought that this painting is a good way of uh, sailing into the night. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Oh, Petra, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, a feast for the eyes, the ears, and to end on a note um, for me, especially with the connectivity to some of these contemporary American makers is, is really wonderful. And, and thank you too for 
you know, um, smoothly bridging between the fine and the decorative here as well. And I, 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 that's one big takeaway from, from my talk, from, um, from your talk. Um, a few questions have come in in the chat, if you, if you don't mind staying on a moment, uh, moment longer. Sure, if, if people can stand it, I really went over my time. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> they, can um, all, they can all leave, of course, that's okay. <laughs> um, one uh, from Leonard Hobbler. Do you think the carpet in the Phillips house was designed by Cotier? It appears to be a large Persian carpet, or might that have been one of the ones that he was retailing, but not necessarily producing in the um, textile workshop? Well, here I'm going to ask my friend Max Donnelly to respond. Hello, can you hear me? Um, I'm sure you're right, um, Petra. I'm sure it is um, one of the um, carpets which would have been retailed, um, but having been, you know, purchased um, from from a dealer of, of carpets or rugs. There is um, in one of the documents we found is a sort of prospectus of Cotty and Company. It was printed in London, published in London, but uh, for the, it was clearly aimed at the, at the American market and Petch and I cite it uh, quite often in the book and in one section it talks about the carpets and floor coverings which are sourced from various places. So yes indeed I'm sure that's the origin of, of this carpet. We also know that Collier traveled to Cairo so he actually, um, he traveled a lot and a lot of it was for buying stuff and for his health too but uh... Um, what about the Anna Riddle Scott piano, which is really an extraordinary piece? Where where is that now? Is that in a collection? I wasn't sure if I'd missed that on a slide. That was. It is actually in still in a uh, in the Piedmont piano shop in um, in uh, San Francisco. Uh, they own it, and I think if you want to buy it, I mean it's it's for sale. <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, it's, a, you know, you can't really put it in a New York apartment, so you really have to build a house around it, I think. <laughs> Were there other pianos that you came upon or other musical instruments too? Yeah, he, he did that quite a bit, both in England and in New York, right, Max? You found several pianos, grand pianos and uprights in, in, in the UK. Uh, there's one in Canada, I think. Uh, there's another one that was at auction. Yeah, this was uh, this was some in, an interesting. I I did not really mention it. While none, very little of the furniture is signed. We, I mean, the clock is kind of an uh, an exception. Uh, the pianos are always signed. The other furniture is not. Right, Max? Uh, that's right. In uh, the 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 um, British ones tend to be made by Broadwood. And uh, there's probably some more work to be done there because there are Broadwood, ar Broadwood archives, which um, are, I think, privately owned. But anyway, that's a potential source. But we did come across a few. Some are ebonized uh, and painted. Some were uh, pen work. Um, and some were, um, although we haven't found one, um, satin wood painted. Um, so different styles. Um, but nothing quite as grand as the one that you showed or the ones that turn up in America, suggesting as you say Petra that the uh, maybe the budget uh, in the States was higher for these things than 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 Cottage clients in 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 uh, Britain. So that that actually brings us to a few have been asking, um, you know, how might um, you both characterize, you know, why there is a sort of paucity of, of um, materials, research, um, are there family papers, archives? Um, is there, does there, have you found more in the States rather than say in the UK or in Australia or perhaps vice versa? Well, you want me to start in America, Max, and you can talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, the UK. We have found very, very little in the United States. Um, there is, you know, unless, for example, for art dealers in particular, uh, there are there are lots of archives. There are Nodler archives. There, there are, many of the art dealers have have stock books and stuff like that. And the Getty, of course, has made a kind of a, a point of, of collecting them. But we have none of this for 
for cardio. Now, I did not mention because I'm you know, really running out of time. In the case of Cardio's art collection, um, he 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 bought art because he sold it in his shop, but he also saw it as an investment for himself. So he had a, he part of it was his private collection. And he saw that as a nest egg for his family. He knew he was going to die young or he suspected he was going to die young. So he, he, he kept that as a nest egg for his family. And so we do have the auction catalog of that sale of everything that was left uh, in, in his collection. So, so much of what we have found is from newspapers and auction catalogs, except in Aust Australia. Well, Max, you, you can maybe talk about England and Australia. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, it's true. Uh, same, same in the UK, where there isn't much documentation at all um, that we found. But um, we did find, um, for example, some correspondence, which uh, we quote, which um, from from a circle of um, Cotier's patrons in Aberdeen, and they're um, they're, they're full of anecdotes, and they throw they put a lot of colour into the story, uh, as do the some of his correspondence with uh, Dutch. Um, with, with Netherlandish artists, um, but, uh, but there's very little um, to go on. We did find some um, designs for stained glass windows in the UK. They were very interesting. And interesting enough, they um, also a number of uh, windows for uh, designs for windows in the States, such as one of the, the um, Avery Library one that Petra showed, which does suggest that they were designed or at least, uh, sorry, that they were made or at least designed in, in Britain. And there's another one from the Sage Chapel at Cornell. Um, is it Cornell? Where the, um, the, the where, where again the, the windows were designed in London and might have been made in London, and that's from from 1901, I think. But one of the things that interested me uh, briefly was um, where things turned up. And one thing I would say is I was very struck by the fact that how many of the ceramics uh, turn up in the United States? They hardly ever turn up in Britain. It's possible they were sent over there in the last 30, 40, 50 years, but it's more likely that they were shipped over to the States at the time. So I thought that was very interesting. So you're far more likely to find a cottier plate in uh, the US than you are in the UK. So that does suggest they were being shipped out in some quantity in the 18, uh, probably the 1880s. Um, with the furniture, um, someone, I think, if I read correctly in the chat, said that there were not... Um, why, why, why were there not many known pieces of furniture? And I think it probably is partly because they're not stamped and there weren't catalogues produced. So it's actually very often hard to identify them. But I think some of the photographs that Petra has unearthed uh, of interiors in New York in which we publish should help smoke out some more pieces because they're quite distinctive. Um, and, um, and I think that pro probably there are, there are a lot more things out there than, than we, you would realise. And then briefly, um, in, the, in Australia, what's interesting there is that a number of Cotier's uh, workmen, um, decorators, go out to work in Australia, and he visits Australia twice, um, but with his family. But um, there, they have a, a whole um, archive in the, is it the Mitchell Library in Sydney of designs for interior decoration, and they are fascinating. Um, we reproduce a number of them, or Andrew does in his chapters, um, and they are absolutely fascinating. And they give you some idea of probably what the company was doing in the UK and probably um, sometimes in the States as well. So, so um, one of the things we did in the book was to try and try and join the dots um, and use the information we found in various countries to help fill in the story where we didn't have the information. Well, Max, you may have just sort of answered this, um, but just specifically with regards to stained glass, was there any sort of um, mark or, or, or were you finding signatures on that as well? Um, not so much in the designs themselves, but, but on the actual panels. Okay, um, I just, uh, if I can answer that briefly. Yes, um, the earliest windows are just signed Cotier very often and dated. Um, and then um, you will often find a signature on the windows. Usually you'll find a signature on the church windows and sometimes uh, with a little anchor motif, which was almost like the uh, trademark, the symbol of the company, which they also used on their letterhead in London and in New York and Australia, in fact. 
Um, so yes, uh, they're very often signed, um, which uh, is very helpful, um, but there are no indications of the individual um, painter's marks or anything, as far as I know. But sometimes on the chargers, there are monograms. Yeah, the same with the church windows in New York. The, the church in, uh, the, uh, the, of the Incarnation on Madison Avenue, the window is signed Cotier and Co. New York, interestingly, even though, you know, I don't, we don't think it was made in New York. Uh, but then one in, of the Brooklyn churches has Cotier and Co. London and New York. So I think that the New York was more the idea of uh, where the firm was, not necessarily that the window was made in New York. At least that, that is what we have concluded. Uh, actually, yeah, it's funny you should say that because a lot I hadn't thought about that, but a lot of the British windows also say London and New York. Yeah, yeah, right. But they are showing off the fact that they have, they're international. Um, I guess just another one. You mentioned that there were a lot of cottiers here in the States, descendants, were just over the course of your research, any um, anything new you've turned up? Were you in touch with them directly? Um, we always enjoy those sort of connections to the, to the present. Well, we were both in touch with some relatives uh, who have, who I mentioned earlier, the, por the portraits of J. Alden Ware of uh, family members of Cotier. So they showed us actually, uh, they sent us some images of these portraits of one of the Cotier's wife, one of Cotier. Uh, they're in, not in very good condition. So, you know, we couldn't really uh, reproduce them in, um, in the book. But uh, yeah, there are, uh, you know, as I mentioned, two of his children actually lived in, in the United States and married Americans. So there, there, I think there are quite a few. You have been in touch also with several, right, Max? Yes, that's right. And actually, um, they, they were um, some, some of the English descendants as well, um, one of whom had, I think, a Cotier plate, a Cotier charger. Um, so that was very helpful. And we also, um, we got in touch or were contacted by um, some of the descendants of the people who uh, had the memorial windows made as well, which was very interesting. Um, for example, the, the windows which uh, were designed, for, uh, which were made for the Earl of North Esk um, and which Van Gogh indeed had commented on uh, when he visited the London shop. And uh, so the descendants of uh, the North Esk, the Earl of North Esk, uh, were very helpful in uh, putting together that story and giving us some information about them. Interestingly, we haven't found any descendants in Australia, and one of Cotier's daughters also married an Australian doctor, uh, but I don't think that Andrew has, has found those relatives. Do you remember what he did? I don't think so. I don't recall that, um, but there was a, I think the, the, the bust of, of Lion, he came from, the, from a family uh, connection. So he was in touch with the business partner's descendants. Uh -oh. But you're right. And I, I wonder, I thought for some reason, I might be wrong that the uh, Cotty's uh, daughter uh, and her Australian husband didn't have children possibly. So there were no direct descendants. Oh, I could oh, be wrong. Oh, that's, that's possible. Yeah. I don't know. Well, um, Petra, thank you so much for this evening. This has really, really been a treat for us all. Um, and Max, thank you for answering all these questions so patiently. Um, it's really, we're, we're just thrilled to have you, you both here and we can't wait to get our hands on the book. Um, I see Alexis has also dropped into the chat a link to order it. Um, just want to thank everyone for being here and mention we have two other um, upcoming lectures. I think on the 22nd is um, Mary Church Terrell, who was one of the first um, female heads of the double NAACP. And then um, in early March, we have um, a talk on <laughs> early romantic, um, <laughs> romantic ads, <laughs> people seeking people um, in the city uh, during, the, during the era. Um, so please look out for those upcoming talks. Um, if I've missed anything, please jump in, Eva, Alexis, but otherwise um, say thank you again. Um, look forward to seeing you all soon.
Thanks, Caroline. It was great. Very it much enjoyed amazing. it. Thank you both so much. Thank you all. It was amazing. Yes, thank you. And now Max is going to he's going to bed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good night. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Bye. Thank you all.